Well, it is a huge concern be, because of the winter and how cold the winter is going to be, uh, and, and that you're going to have many people without power and possibly without water. I mean, I think that was one of the concerns out of Kiev, that it wasn't just that the power supply would be affected, that but people might not have water. I mean, thus far, the Russians have been doing a lot of damage with these drones that Iranian made. Uh, the Ukrainians have been able to shoot down some of these drones, but some of them have had an impact. And when they do, it's been quite substantial. We see that for the Russians have been able to basically damage 40 percent of Ukraine's power grid. And, and they've also damaged outside of Kyiv. They've damaged a, near Kherson, where 1.5 kilometers of power lines have been destroyed. And this policy by the Russians, I mean, it's very unconventional. It's, they're really targeting civilians. They're trying to really undermine their resolve, their morale. They're, they're trying to, to get the Ukrainians to give up. And they have to do so because they're not really winning by other conventional methods. But it's the Ukrainian civilians that are facing the brunt of it. And it's just incredibly difficult conditions. How long can Russia keep attacking infrastructure like it is? I mean, I think the Russians are going to keep attacking uh, until the Ukrainians give up. What we're seeing from Putin is that he's willing to do whatever it takes. He's going to recruit people that don't want to be recruited. They're even using private militias in, in eastern Ukraine. I think that Putin is willing to, to use any type of tactic necessary to get better control over at least eastern Ukraine, which at the moment he's not able to control. And so until he can get the war going in a way that he is more comfortable with and until he's able to get control over the situation, I think we're going to see a lot of these types of attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure. What is the likelihood that the water supply will be severely impacted by these attacks? I mean, well, there is there is a high likelihood that this could happen. I and mean, that's one of the things that the Ukrainian politicians and leaders, are, they're warning about, that, that this is a really dire situation. They have plan Bs in place. That's what they've said. And that they're trying to to ensure that everybody remains calm. Uh, but they're also trying to reduce consumption uh, of energy. Uh, and, and they're trying to uh, attack the Russians before with some of the drone attacks that they're having. They're trying to attack these drones before they have a chance of actually causing some of the permanent damage. Is Ukraine receiving enough assistance from other countries and allies to address this energy crisis? Well, the U.S. has been meeting uh, diplomatically with Russian counterparts, trying to come up with some sort of uh, solution to this issue over what's going to happen in, in the winter and all these attacks that are taking place on energy infrastructure. The Ukrainians are going to continue to need more weapons that can counter these drones. They're pleading for that. The West has been unwavering in its commitment to provide these types of weapons and this type of logistical support. But the Ukrainians are in an incredibly difficult situation. Even though the war is going as badly as possible for the Russians, it's not going very well for the Ukrainians either because their civilians are so severely affected. And that leads to a real human security crisis that is very difficult for Western uh, nations to address until there can be some kind of ceasefire. And at the moment, that's what the U.S. and other Western allies are trying to push for, some kind of ceasefire or trying to get Ukraine to come to the table to negotiate. But Zelensky has been very clear that he will not negotiate with Putin directly. In fact, a law was passed on October 4th saying that there would be no negotiations with Putin. But the possibility of negotiating with the Russian government is of course, still on the table. How are Ukrainians reacting to this? What do they want to see happen in terms of negotiations? Well, I think part of the problem with the coming to the table with negotiations is that this would be more likely to happen had the Russians not decided to go for some of the most brutal tactics that we've seen against civilians. That's really only strengthened, in some ways, the Ukrainian resolve, even amidst all of these hardships that they're facing, to not want to negotiate with them. I mean, the Russian tactics have been so vile that it's really galvanized Ukrainian nationalism. They don't want to be willing, you know, they don't want to have to lose any of their territory. 
Uh, and that's something that I think Putin really miscalculated on. And lastly, nearly half a million in the people are without power at the moment. What is the government doing to assist them, especially as the winter months approach? Well, they're trying to communicate about consumption patterns and to keep consumption patterns low. I mean, there's fears that 4.5 million people could be without power. And, and so they're trying to communicate that there is a plan B in place uh, and, and that they're working with Western allies to, 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 to try to support the civilians the best that they could. But it, it's, it's very, very difficult for the Ukrainian government in this situation. I mean, this is really the perfect storm because winter is coming. People are going to be incredibly cold, in need of energy, and the Russians are, are going to be absolutely relentless in their attacks. It looks like a really challenging situation at the moment. Professor Natasha Lindstedt, good to talk. Thank you. Thanks for having me.